you like to hear the puppa cheers And play the characters that you cheer So join us as we go, go, go Below the Frame on this episode of Below the Frame, I'm talking to the multi-talented Alice Deneen. She's a puppeteer, she's a writer, she's a puppet captain, she's an interior decorator. She does it all, and I'm talking to her today. Plus, we'll be talking about cramped spaces and asking a puppeteer about not puppets. All of that right now. It's time to go Below the Frame. Go, go, go Below the Frame. Welcome to Below the Frame. I'm Matt Vogel, and I'm so grateful that you are listening to our little podcast about the Muppet performers and other folks that are off screen, behind the camera, and below the frame. Today, I am talking with my sweet, sweet friend, Alice Deneen, whom I have known ever since I started in this business. And she is a fascinating person, and I cannot wait for you to hear our conversation. So let's get to it, okay? Let's go Below the Frame with Alice Deneen. Alice Deneen, how you doing? Welcome to Below the Frame. Thank you very much, Matt Vogel. I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's good to... Uh, we are actually seeing each other's faces. I'm so glad to see your face. It's not in person, but... But it's, it's you know, Yeah. It's the next, next best, best thing. thing. But, yeah, yeah. We've been subsisting on Zoom for a long time now, so it feels right. al- almost like that's just human interaction now. <laughs> just, just the way you do it. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions about your life. Okay. Okay. And, um, and uh, so I'm excited to talk to you because I think there's going to be things that, uh, that I learn about you on this uh, little chat that we're going to have. All right. Well, we've known each Maybe. other a long time, but I, I, th- I think there's probably still some, some distance to, yeah. To- I, I think so. You know, the, I've, everybody that I've talked to, no matter how long I've known them, I, I always learn something, which is, which is super fun. So. Yeah, you are plumbing the depths of our good friends, and I learn something every time when I when I listen <laughs> I to your know, shows. I'm like, what, really? I How know, could that really, be? It's and, crazy. Uh, wow, I never heard yeah. that story. Yeah, I know. I know it's a lot of fun. So let's start with you, Alice. Okay. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Oakland, California, and uh, it's uh, well Oakland for a while, and then a little. If you make a Venn diagram of Oakland, there's a tiny little town completely surrounded by Oakland that's not Oakland called Piedmont, um, and I actually went to school there. Uh, but um, it's it's uh, you know it's essentially Oakland. Tell me about growing up there in Oakland slash Piedmont. Uh, it is a absolutely beautiful place. It's the Bay Area. I don't know how much time you spent there, but it's oh yeah. You know, Lovely. it's green. It's 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 temperate. It's uh, it's very. It feels very. You know, there are influences from all over the world, and San Francisco is a very kind of European feeling city. And there's great food, and and there's just nature everywhere. And I love it, love it, love it. But when you grow up somewhere, you think the whole world's like that, right? So, right. Uh, I I just I I I thought mm, I, I can't wait to get out of here. I want to go someplace, <laughs> new places, to explore the world. And yeah, I have very. I had, uh, yeah, wanderlust from an early age and, and was taking backpacks and going to Europe and seeing places and getting out. Uh, tell me about your family. Ooh, well, I have one sibling, um, who, and her name is Carol. And yes, she, I, I guess, yes. Yeah, you're familiar with Carol. I know Carol, yeah. Uh, Carol Deneen Binion. Um, a lot of people think that... Uh, that um, she and Ron Binion are brother and sister because they have the same last name, and she and I don't. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, and so people are often often uh, pleased and shocked and delighted to realize that we're sisters because oftentimes they work on sets with both of us for a really long time. For those who don't know, she is a wonderful costumer and uh, has worked for Muppets and Sesame, and we're currently working together on Crank Anchors and other things. Uh, but she's. Uh, she and I uh, did puppets together from our earliest childhood, making them and playing with them and doing silly voices and watching the Muppet Show. And we were both obsessed from uh, kind of an early age. And, and uh, she was making wonderful replicas of, not complete replicas, but influenced by puppets from the time she was, I don't know, 10 or 11. And then I was carrying them to school and doing little shows with a, Jacket thrown over the jungle gym and uh, just <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's how you that's, yeah, that's how you make the stage you gotta uh-huh. get behind hide behind something you need a playboard so yeah yeah uh-huh. because like on Sesame Street and the Muppet Show I mean there would be maybe a brick wall or something but yeah on Sesame there was know, always a wall and they were behind the wall and so you that's what you did that's yeah. why you did it 
that's 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 why I made myself a little a little place to or behind a bench or whatever worked yeah. at the time, and uh, then you know I would sing Rainbow phone. Connection or whatever. I'm sure it was. I'm yeah. glad there were no uh, cell phone cameras in that era because it would be painful right. to watch now. <laughs> I know, but don't you wish you had something of it just to be like, oh my gosh, there that's what that's, that started yeah. it all there. Yeah, just a little just a little something. Just and, a little clip. Yeah. I mean and I loved I loved puppets and I loved all puppets and I, I was I was just the perfect, perfect age for Sesame Street. I mean I was basically I was born the same year it went on the air. And uh and then that rolled into being the same perfect age for Muppet Show, you know, because the, yeah. the target audience that went right through. And then uh, uh, perfect age for Dark Crystal, which was, we'll get to that later. Oh, yeah. That, that, one, that one goes deep. Yeah. And then, yeah. Um, but then I was, I was a little too cool by the time Fraggle Rock <laughs> and uh, some of the later Muppet movies were, were coming yeah. out, like uh, Muppet Caper and so cool. those are Those are the ones I'm less familiar with because that's the, during the very brief that's... period of my life when I was cool. <laughs> You've always been cool to me, Alice. That's all I know. Uh, Thank you, Matt. Did you ever build puppets? I know you said Carol did, but did you ever do any of that? Any interest in that? A little tiny bit. A little tiny bit. Um, if you uh, if you are familiar with her work, which you are, you know that she's extremely detail oriented and incredibly skilled. And if you have to try to build something beside beside that in the basement at the same table with all yeah. the same stuff and you're like literally gluing your fingers together and drawing blood and she's making these beautiful little things uh, that win uh, prizes at, yeah i just i gave up pretty early what you know, one time she was sewing something she was embroidering and she was and she had her little needles stuck into the shag rug of our of our little playroom um you know so she could see the different colors of thread and she's embroidering and i'm being myself and i'm just running through the house and i did just like a flying leap and i attacked her and i landed on the needles and wound up in the hospital oh, um, oh my gosh she, you know yeah true story and that but that really typifies my relationship to building and making and crafting <laughs> yeah <laughs> i get it I know. yeah yeah uh, tell me about your parents. Uh, well, uh, their their names are Kathy and Larry, and they're great. Uh, they are uh, both still with us and still married, and I'm very fortunate. Uh, oh. My dad was a museum curator for his career at the University Art Museum at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. And uh, my mom also worked at UC Berkeley doing graphics and signage and uh, library displays and things, so not dissimilar. Um, Is and that later, what you meant? They, they, met at, they met as students at UC Berkeley, uh, singing in the Glee Club. And, That's adorable. Uh, yeah, it really is. Uh, actually, my grandparents also went to Berkeley and met there. So uh, it's a long, long, long history with, uh, with UC Berkeley. And, um, and I almost went there, but then decided I needed to get out and go someplace different. And, you know, <laughs> I mentioned that before. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, but my son's first baby gift from my mom was a little cow bear with a cow t-shirt on it. I, I think there are some expectations. Yeah, anyway, yeah. yeah. So they were, uh, they, they went as students to Berkeley, met there. My dad did a brief stint in the army against his will, which he still resents and still rants about. And then uh, <laughs> they both spent their entire careers there and retired from there. Yeah, so, so like when you were a kid, what were, other than playing with puppets and, and, you know, being a kid, what were other specific kinds of things that you did? I loved to draw and, and, and paint. It wasn't, well, it wasn't the fabric arts, uh, but I did like to, I did like to make art and do art and clay, always in clay classes and, and always in theater, always in children's choruses, ch- Oakland Children's Chorus, Oakland Youth Chorus, um, Oakland Summer Theater, uh, involved in all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I liked to, uh, I also liked to write. And um, did you ever have Cricket Magazine when you were growing up? Uh, is it was it similar to like a highlights or something like that? Kind of like yeah. It was it was a it was a it feels familiar. Yeah, it had stories and poems and you know a little format and always had a little comic across the bottom that was all bugs talking to each other. But um, they had uh, contests every month. They had. Uh, a story contest and a poetry contest and a drawing contest. And I was always entering those. I was always like, writing did you ever my win? stories. I did win. Yes. I did finally in about in second grade, I think, I won first place in the story contest. Finally and in this... second grade. That's fairly early on. <laughs> well, I've been. How? Like, 
since you could draw with a crayon, were you sending your stories in? I was sending in my stories. And, uh, um, so second and grade, I, you won. Second grade, I won, and this box arrives in the mail from Cricket Magazine, and guess what the first prize was? A uh, box of dead crickets. It was not a box of dead crickets. It was okay, a puppet, good. Matt. What? It was a You're puppet. You're kidding me. It was a pig puppet. And a pig puppet. It was a mm-hmm. pig puppet, and I wore the mouth out of that thing over and over and over, and my sister would replace it over and over with a new felt mouth, and I'd go right through the, right through it over and over again. And, and, um, and that started you know, sort of the actual kind of physical puppet collection and actually using them and performing with them. Before that, I was just a fan. But I know that at least one, maybe a few other people have mentioned uh, Children's Fairyland, at, uh, it, which is a little park in Oakland. And it has a mm-hmm. uh, has a puppet theater there, and if you're a kid in Oakland, you go to Fairyland and you see the puppet shows. And the, this uh, wonderful man named Louis Smallman uh, was uh, the the puppet master there for decades, and um, and he became a little bit of a of a mentor to me. I did children's theater there when I was in elementary school. You know, I went there as a tiny little bitty, and then um, that was my high school job. I worked there uh, in all through high school, summers and weekends, and um, the high schoolers would run around. You know, you'd sell tickets in the morning, and then you'd do a shift, like running the little merry-go-round, and then, and then three times a day, you'd run over to the puppet theater, and you'd help Lewis with his puppet shows, and then you'd run back, and you know, you'd scoop ice cream for a while. Like, they rotated us around. <laughs> and what kind of puppets did Lewis do? He did very simple hand puppets, rod puppets sometimes, and marionettes as well. Oh. And um, they were they were all pre recorded tracks, and he did them three times a day. But he wrote everything, and he you know he painted the sets, which were you know roll up, drop down, very old school European wow. style. And and it was a wonderful little proscenium theater that was shaped like a book. And he did classic fairy tales that were about. 15 minutes long. I mean, I wound up doing some of the voices on the tracks for some of his newer ones. I think he's, they might still be using some of those tapes. But um, it was uh, it was a really nice introduction to doing several different kinds of puppets with somebody who really loved it. And, and puppeteers from, you know, around the Bay Area would come and visit. There was a, often a summer puppet festival event that would happen. And um, it was a really active... A puppeteers Guild in the Bay Area that was actually when I was a kid was run by the Osnowitzes, uh, Frank's ah. parents. Did so you ever go was, to any any of those functions? Any of the I did, Puppeteer Guild yeah. functions you did. Mm-hmm. And they because um, they would have outdoor festivals often at Fairyland or in a park or something, and it was very open to the public. It seems now like some of those are are kind of they're for puppeteers specifically and less about bringing the public in. But I think they wanted to share and show. You know a lot, a, a lot of things, and of course, Frank was part of those and around. But I didn't, I didn't know him. But they did. I'm sure they had something to do with the fact that there was a wonderful exhibit of Sesame Street puppets in Oakland um, when I was about, I don't know, eleven or so. And uh, and I remember dragging my mom down to that several times. Like we gotta go see that show again. We gotta go see. It. And they were there, and you know, in what these glass What did you think seeing vitrines. them? What did you when you saw them behind the plexiglass? What was your brain doing? Your well, I have your old brain. Yeah, I, I, I remember thinking that they were so big. And there was, uh, I remember there was one of the horses, uh, Buster probably, and, uh, and, and just thinking, wow, it's so, it's so, it's so huge. And seeing, um, seeing the photographs of people, you know, performing them and, and realizing that, that those were actually real people doing that down there. And of course, intellectually, I understood that, but it's a different to actually see it. And yeah. we didn't have, you know, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have we did a, a whole lot, Not of a lot access. Not a lot behind the scenes, yeah. Not a lot of behind the scenes. Was so, this the first time that you ever saw a, a Muppet performer? Yeah, definitely okay. at that at that museum show. You know, of course, I'd grown up watching Sesame Street. In fact, we had a black and white TV, and I remember my grandfather being there, and my sister and I were sitting there, and we were maybe two and three years old, something like that. We're very close in age, and um, and watching Sesame, and they were, were saying something about colors or something, and he was sat there and he watched, and he marched out of the house and he went down to the street, down the 
<laughs> there was a corner store that was like had electronics and sold TVs, yeah. and he came back with a color TV, and he set oh. it up, and he turned it on, and it was it all happened so fast that I think the show was still on. Like he, <laughs> he immediately he went. And, he immediately went, and he came, and it was just a That's small hilarious. boxy color TV. But yeah. I remember thinking. Big Bird is yellow. He's oh. yellow. He's not white. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing to never thought, have. You wouldn't have known. How would you have known? No, I thought Big Bird was white. That, anyway, that, it was a magic that, moment. That's how it happened in my mind. Of course, we misremember these things when we're. I'm going with this. Two this years is what old, happened. But I'm going to stick with this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's how I remember it. Truly, it's not. That yeah. is how it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, when you were old enough to go and study somewhere, were you going to be a puppeteer? What was your What was your thought? moving forward out of high school? Uh, I did go to college. I went to Oberlin College in Ohio, which is a small liberal arts school, which um, really does its students the wonderful favor of letting them march to their own mm. their own drummer. It's, it's, it's very much... Uh, it, it's not about jumping through certain hoops that are established. It's about, you know, here... Here are some vague notions of how to make your own hoops. Go, you know, and 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 but it, you know, and it's very it's very academic and very, you know, it's not underwater basket weaving, but it's very. Uh, you could design your own majors, and you could major in several things and kind of blend stuff together. And and uh, and also the reason that I was sold on going to to Oberlin is because in addition to a liberal arts college, they have a conservatory of music that um, is very very well regarded. I would say. You know, right up there with some of the great music conservatories in the in the country. Um, and I was not a professional musician level, but I'd always been a singer and always been very interested in in, in music. And I wanted to be around musicians. So, um, and sure enough, they mixed us all up in the dorm. Even though you were you were either a college student or a conservatory student, but we all were in the same dorms and dining halls and right. and so on. So. Um, so it was, it was, it was great, you know. Like right next door is a budding world class opera singer, or you know, someone who is is figuring out how to, you know, was in the early days of electronic music, and people were experimenting all night long with these. Wow. Yeah, and it just it was it was it was great. And um, uh, what, what were you there for? What did you decide to create? What kind of major? Well, I wound up, because of the art museum influence and influence from my dad, uh, I thought that I might go into art history or conservation or museum work. But I was also super interested in science, and I took a lot of biology and chemistry, and then I thought maybe about doing art conservation. And um, Okay, so I'm going to hit pause just for a second. Okay. Why didn't you want to be a puppeteer? Uh, I well, here's the thing. I always wound up in the theater department. I was building puppets for, I built witch puppets for Macbeth. And I built an entire uh, puppet jury for uh, for a Brecht play for uh, for Arturo Ui. And, um, and I wound up uh, building, you know, building little, little, uh, props and puppets and characters for other people's shows. And then Oberlin does a thing every January called Winter Term. Um, which is, it's so cold in northern Ohio, um, and people would lose their minds and just need to leave. And so, so for January, it's a tiny little, um, it's a tiny little term of school, and you have to come up with an independent project and do it. And you can do it on campus or off campus. You just have to have a faculty member approve it. And there are, um, you know, there are some that are big group projects that happen on campus, and others that are just one person somewhere off doing their thing. So I did an entire production of Faust with marionettes, and <laughs> wow, and uh, and I got and I did it in the style that I'd learned at Fairyland. I. I got my actor friends together and we recorded a track start to finish and I dropped in some music from, you know, I think I used pictures at an exhibition or something. And, um, and it was very much like those pre-recorded fairyland shows that I'd been, you know, doing in high school. Yeah. Um, and I even used the exact same little simple one handed airplane controllers that Lewis had taught me how to build. And, and, uh, you know, he gave me his little patterns and so on. Again, had I'm you, not a craft built person. These? I know, but you I, built these puppets? I did. I built How these many? puppets. Eight. 
that's a lot of puppets to build. It's a lot of puppets to build in a in a in, and and I'm not a craftsperson as 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 much per se. I mean, I am like so I you did... claim. Now I'm starting to doubt this because <laughs> <laughs> you you just said you built like puppets for you know a half a dozen other people's things and your I own did, thing. I did. I was doing a lot of well, like I considered myself and like a drawing painting type mm-hmm. of like mm-hmm. flat like get messy get your hands yeah. in it kind of thing not a not a craftsperson does sure. there's a difference i okay. oh yeah yeah sure yes there is but still okay. again i didn't sew the costumes. I glued them all together with hot glue, and I, and and I, I yeah. And, and then, but I bet they looked really good. I'm sure they looked really good. They, I think they looked good enough. Okay. Mm. You did this project, the winter project. You weren't thinking I'm going to be a puppeteer. You were just doing I that as a project. I still wasn't thinking I could be a, a be a puppeteer because I didn't think people actually did that. Right. You know. Okay. Right. Yeah. Or I or I thought like a very few people do that, and they've been doing it for forty years, and it's a closed fortress, and and right. um, and there's, you know, I knew the professional puppeteer that I knew was Lewis. He'd been doing it for forty years. It was you know like that's yeah. And, and also I knew about Jim Henson, and I knew about mm-hmm. all of them, and they'd been doing it for forty years, and it was just right. you know you you that's something. Oh, I, that, I totally relate to that. That's exactly what I felt. I was like, they, that's what they do. They do that. I they do that. Do that. Yeah, I'd have to start something new totally from scratch and invent my own entire universe of characters and 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 I, you know, it just seemed like an overwhelming task and It's a lot of work. It's more than you yeah. can do in a winter term. That's true. Um, <laughs> That's true. So, but then when I graduated with a mishmash major in the arts and sciences, uh, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I graduated in the middle of the year in in uh, December and as a little gift to myself, I went to do an internship at the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta. So mm-hmm. I thought, I will, I'll fill out the rest of the year, then all my friends are going to graduate, and we'll all get an apartment someplace and figure out what we're going to do with our lives. But I needed to wait for my friends. Right. Because I graduated early. You didn't want early. to start before them, yeah. Yeah, I actually graduated late, but it was early in relation to a, a, a bunch of my friend group. So I... Yeah, I graduated in December. I went home for Christmas. I got in got in a little used car, and I drove to Atlanta. And um, I rented a room from a in a this woman's apartment from a from a ad on a bulletin board in a bookstore. And I uh-huh. phoned the bookstore and I said, "Are there any ads for roommates on your bulletin board?" <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and, so, and there and there were and I and I what called part one of town of was this I, in 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 Atlanta? It was in uh, basically Little Five Points, the cool neighborhood. Yeah, because I was st- it was this was still during the brief period when I was cool. I mean, I was, oh right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although it was falling away fast because here I was doing an internship. <laughs> yeah, at the there you go. The yeah, as soon as you fall into right. puppets, then you're you're definitely not cool anymore. I guess, right? I I don't I I, have I don't no idea. I think it cycles around. Like I think you become so yeah. uncool that you get cool again. Yeah. Um, but uh, I've ceased to worry about cool anymore, which is a wonderful thing about being a little more mature. <laughs> so I go there to do this internship with this great guy yeah. named Peter Hart. And Peter Hart uh, taught three interns a year. Um, the one right before me was uh, Mary Harrison, who's who, who Mary Harrison Kowal, who's still a puppeteer. The one before her was Robin Walsh Howard, who remains a puppeteer and builder to this day. The one before her, I believe, was Basil Twist. And the one before him was... Uh, Ron Binion, and before that, it was Peter Lintz. Never heard who, of him. I never heard of him. That guy. I don't, I don't think I have that in the correct order at all. But that's no. that's they were. So doing those were three, people that were his interns. Peter Hart's interns at the Center for Puppetry Arts. Yes, and you got a real crash course in all different kinds of things. There was a museum to work in, so I felt right at home. Doing, so were you a docent in the museum? Did you? Did uh, we helped. A, yeah, helped a bit with uh, with school groups and things. Um, we sort of we did a lot of different things as interns, but. Um, in that museum, there was a, was a, a mystic from the Dark Crystal, oh. um, as well as many other Muppets and real puppets. And that was the first time I'd seen those real things. I had never never gotten to the Smithsonian to see them there, and there wasn't any. You know, I'd seen the Sesame Street ones at that exhibit, but this was the first time that I could go. And I would I would walk into that museum 
when things were quiet and I would just stand there and I would just look at the mystic and I would just walk around it. It was on a plinth in the middle in an open space and you could go all the way around it. No glass, but these beautiful spotlights and I would just look at that thing. And wow. it was it was incredible. And um and very inspirational. And um yeah, one of the first people that I met there was Mary Harrison Kowal. She was still around having just finished her internship and she was still hanging out in Atlanta and she kind of, you know, befriended me on day one and was like, hey, let me show you a good place to get, you know, cheap food and, and we'll talk puppets and then I'm going to, maybe three or four days after I arrived there, she was like, I want to take you to meet one of my great buddies, like my really good friend, his name is Peter. And he just got back from his first season on Sesame Street. Oh. And I thought, oh, okay, cool. That's, that, sounds, that sounds good. Yeah. So we went to this, you know, like this attic apartment and, and we, we hung out. Peter doesn't remember this. Um, <laughs> but we hung out there for a little while and then we went and got coffee and dessert across, you know, a couple blocks away at, the, at, a, at, a, at a place they liked. And, and, uh, and, that was, and then we were just sort of casual social friends here and there, you know, through Mary and around for for a while uh, and he was working at the tuxedo shop and uh, getting ready to go back to to, to Sesame Street uh, people who have been following along closely will know that this pans out in a very big way later on in my life oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and, uh, and twice three, multiple times um, but uh, the first way in which it panned out in a tremendously influential way is that uh, at that time after I'd been at the center about a year um, there were these auditions up in New York, and it was really one of the first times that they did a, like a what has later become to be a diversity workshop. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for women only, and they were wanting to add some characters to Sesame Street because it was all there was Rosita, and right. there was Prairie Dawn, and a little bit of Betty Lou, but that was about it. That's about it. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And they were starting to play with the idea of this Zoe character, and they wanted to sort of add more over time. But they said we don't have anyone to perform them, so um, we let's let's just see who's out there, and let's start feel, let's start shaking the trees a little bit. And, and so um, Cheryl Henson and Steve Whitmire, first time I saw Kermit in person, was very wow. starstruck. Had come for a, a gala a fundraiser thing at the Center for Puppetry Arts, and. Um, and they did their little gala thing, fundraiser, and I went to that and saw Kermit in person and met a Henson and was, it was all very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was, at that point, by that time I was in the main stage company at the center and they came to the show that I was in uh, the next morning. And then Cheryl came by afterwards and she's like, hey, you know, I don't know if you're interested, but they're looking for women for Sesame Street. Uh, there's going to be an audition in like three weeks. And I was... Uh, I was in this main stage show and I didn't think that I could go, but my dreams were saved by uh, Robin uh, Howard Walsh, who understudied and learned my part and took over for a few days. It was very, very exciting and I got myself up to New York. Had you ever been and, to New York before? Uh, just to visit. My sister had wound up there after college. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd visited during school breaks and things. Yeah, so I knew my way around a little bit and it was a big cattle call audition with like 400 women oh. there. Oh yeah. my gosh. In in phases throughout the day on the first day, so we were all there. And did they just there. whittle them down very quickly into like a manageable number? Yeah, yeah. Like Kevin was having ten people at a time, just like put on put on fraggles. At that point, wow. it was little fraggles, oh. and just like count to ten, and then he was sort of saying, "Okay, you and you come back at three and you know, oh my gosh, and, and, yeah, that like kind that of was thing. your shot. Counting to ten was it? Counting to ten, yeah. But because I knew that this was coming, and because I knew that there were special mm -hmm. skills involved with monitors and whatever. I went to my uh, vague acquaintance, Peter Linz, mm -hmm. and I said, can you teach me what, how to do this? You know, you're obviously, you've, you've, you've done one season there already. You've made it. You've hit the big time, and you're the authority on the subject for all time. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in this, you know, grandiose influence number one is he set up a monitor and a camera in his, uh, in his apartment. By then, he'd moved to a much nicer apartment with his lovely fiance, and they were very hospitable and nice and you know, took in this little um, petitioner. I was like, Get, <laughs> bestow upon me your knowledge. And, uh, and he taught me how to use a monitor and how, how iFocus works and, 
and uh, you know how to walk in and make eye contact and walk out again and all the things that he still teaches people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and he's a he's a good teacher because I is, made it all the way through teacher. the gauntlet. Yeah, so he's a great teacher. When yes, he is. And when like, did you get it? Were you understanding? Oh, that's eye focus, or, or did it take a little bit of time? Maybe I got it. I got not. it. It made sense to okay. me. It made okay. absolute. It made perfect sense to me, and it made me understand. Uh, how they could do what they do in the movies and on on Muppet Show and and so on. Like all that complex, like how they made it look so alive. Oh, it's because it really looks like it's looking at something. But there was also that training at the, at the, at the center and in the internship with, with Peter Hart. And so on. he says the, the, the magic trick here is to make it look like it's thinking. And that means make it look like it's seeing and make it look like it's making a decision to move. And you know, that, all, all of that. And he said, you can do that with anything. You can do that with a sponge. You can do it. You know, it's just like whatever it is. Yeah. And um, the thing he would always say was, you just put the brain in the puppet. Um, That's great. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, I took that, yeah, I really, I, I really internalized that. I'm like, make this thing think, make it think, make it think. And then later on, uh, I don't remember who it was, added, make it also, make it, make it breathe, make it, make it, mm. put, put, a, put breath. You can, you can, you know, you can make it inhale and exhale. You can yeah. make it make a decision with breath and and uh, and make it think with breath. And, and yeah, that's and, all acting, with, just like acting stuff. That's just acting stuff, but now putting it through this little you know piece of cloth or foam or whatever. Yeah, um, and that that was uh, you know at that at that point, like ha- having that click. And again, you know, Peter is a wonderful teacher, and I think I was one of his very early students. But he like he makes that click for people. You know, he makes it make sense very fast and yeah. very, very easily. And that, um, yeah, it's a great service to his, to his students. I'm going to jump to, you did go to this mm-hmm. cattle call. It was whittled down. And yeah. how far did you make it? Well, it was on the last day, there were eight people left. And they uh, and they sent us away at the end of the day after after this is we were doing a lot of exercises with Kevin and lip syncing to songs and learning choreography and who else was there Stephanie yeah. Bruzo was there uh-huh. and um, I believe Heather Ash was there there were there were several there were several other people there Lisa Buckley and uh, but I think in terms of people who are still sort of actively working on Sesame I. I think Stephanie's the only one. I mean, I will come in and jump in any time, especially on West Coast stuff, but I don't consider myself a Sesame right. Street puppeteer at this point. So I think I think Stephanie's the only one from that workshop that is still there all this still time active. there. And that was, yeah. yeah. And when was that? 1992? Three? Wow. Three. Yeah. We'll be back with more from Alice Deneen in a couple of minutes, but now it's time for a word from our sponsor. That's going to be my son, Jack. Uh, come in, Jack. Jack. Uh, yes. Remember how I couldn't find that ham I bought for my ham and cheese sandwiches and how I knew I put the sleeve of ham in the fridge and I just, I couldn't find it for weeks. It was like it disappeared. Yes, yes. What about it? Well, I found it. <laughs> you did? Yeah, only I don't know if it's good or not. Would you taste it? Uh, no, I will not taste your old fridge ham. How am I supposed to know if it's good or not? Uh, we'll check the expiration date. The what? The date printed on the side there. Used by June 2021? Yes. So it's bad. Eh, it's probably fine. You know what else is probably fine? What's that? This fake ad you're gonna run now. I'm gonna go make a sandwich. Run the fake ad. My name is Todd. I'm a chimney sweep. Well, I loved my career, but but I've been crawling inside chimneys for close to 15 years, and I was starting to get burnt out. My family said I needed to find a hobby. I tried watercolor painting, but you know, it, it wasn't structured enough. I tried ice dancing, but I, I felt too exposed. Then I discovered TV puppetry, and I knew I'd found the perfect hobby. I've always been fine with being crammed into incredibly tight spaces, so the first time I got to climb inside a fake couch, oh, I was smitten. They sewed the cushions down on top of me with, you know, just a, a tiny hole to put my arm through for the puppet. <sighs> I was in heaven. The sweat in my eyes, the, the, the tingling as the blood drained. 
hand out of my arm. The, the, the hot, stale air. You know, all of it helped me rekindle the spark for my day job. So if you're, if you're a chimney sweep <laughs> like me, or maybe you're a race car driver, or a, a lost cave spelunker, or a magician's assistant, or a meerkat, you're gonna love the confined spaces that TV puppetry provides. I can't recommend it highly enough. That's right. Today's episode of Below the Frame is brought to you by Cramped Spaces. Uh, No more really to explain there. We, as Muppet performers, often have to cram our big bodies into little spots and still make the puppetry look effortless. Uh, I myself have been shoved under the steps of 123 Sesame, as well as into just the bottom step on the famous stoop there. I have hunkered down in the trunk of a car while my arm was pushed through the back seat of the car with a a poppin' on my arm. I've been veritably buried in a coffin-like box under a sofa on a popular chat show in the UK. And of course, you know, just being inside Big Bird or Sweetums qualifies as a cramped space in my book. But It's all part of the gig, and I guess you can say that we all get used to it in one way or another. Anyway, I want to give another shout-out and a big thank you to Cramped Spaces for being a sponsor of Below the Frame. Now back to the show. Go below the frame. We're back with Alice Deneen. So you leave this workshop, and you go back down to the Center for Puppetry Arts? Go back down to Center for Puppetry Arts. I finished the season there. They take the summer off. I went to the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center there. It was the second year of the of the O'Neill. That's where I met Pam and Marty. And um, they were teaching workshops at the O'Neill and um, you know, made a bunch of friends, had a great time. Um, several of us from that workshop, including Heather Ash and I think, I think a woman named Laura Gans, who's now a, a writer, uh, we were at the O'Neill together, having been in that audition together. And Pat Nugent called and said, we're doing a Sesame Street 25th anniversary special. We need more puppeteers. Do you want to come and do it? We're in the middle of the week at the O'Neill, and all three of us just got on the train and went back to New York. And we were in Central Park. It was Sesame Street's 25th anniversary special. It was blazing hot. And there was every puppet they had out there in a sort of semicircle on Cherry Hill. And um, and, and Big Bird was uh, singing... um, you know, sing, sing a song, but he was lonely because he didn't have anyone to sing with and whatever. And then all of his friends showed up and then like Lady Smith, Black Mombazo comes up over the hill and they're singing and they've all their harmony and it was amazing and mind blowing. And I'm like, I have a monkey on each hand. <laughs> what a Joey, Joey and Davy monkey <laughs> one on each hand and I'm in the back and I'm like, oh, left, right, la, 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 la. And, and, and just sweat pouring down oh. and, and, uh, and it just, and, and, and I, I think I had Carmen on one side and Fran on the other side and they were so nice and um, and really helpful in setting up and getting the monitors in the right place. And I think I think Pam and Marty couldn't be there because they were in Connecticut at the O'Neill. Yeah. But yeah. everybody else was. <laughs> everybody was there. I met, uh, you know, I had Davey and Joey Monkey, and then I met David Rudman and Joey Mazzarino. I was like, oh, oh these are your monkeys? Hi, I have your monkeys. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was one of those where I, I just felt so excited and scared and freaked out and happy and 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 like you had to pinch yourself every five yeah. minutes because you just can't quite believe that you're there and now at this point were you like oh this is what i want to do oh yeah now that oh, this, by this okay point, so was, it happened you no, at this point there was no option there was no there was no <laughs> right. there's no there's no plan possibility b. <laughs> of failure there's no plan b i'm right. on the train okay. this is happening okay yeah mm-hmm. this is what you and want to do Right. So I left Atlanta. I crashed out in uh, the apartment of a friend of a friend in, in, in Murray Hill. It was, it was lovely. It was way too nice for me to be staying there. Um, and he didn't charge me any rent or anything. Um, wow. what, what he said was, uh, someday, when you make it big, um, support somebody else who's starting out. That's what he said. That's and nice. I, have tried, I have tried to do that. Um, I've tried to do that with a number of people. So I was able to stay there for a whole summer, and I set up a camera and a monitor, and I, you know, I got every Sesame VHS I could <laughs> get my hands on, yeah. and I watched, and I watched, and I watched. I had the best of Ernie and Bert. I had like Elmo's sing along, whatever, and and I just I watched them, and I lip synced along with them, and I practiced my monitor skills, and I, I had 
I had no job and I had no, like, I, and I just did it all day, every day. And eventually I started, um, I started working at a, at a bookstore, um, downtown and, uh, you know, to make a little bit of money, but, um, Mostly, I was I suppose I was just like borrowing money from my dad and saying like I have to do this. I just have to do this. I need a summer. I have to do this. I'm not paying any rent. I just need like enough for cornflakes. <laughs> and um, and then when the Sesame Street season started again in the fall, and um, and they then again Pat Nugent calls up. I don't know how she got in touch with me because I'm moving around and we don't have any cell phones and we don't have any. Right. Like, but she says, we're going to do a, I don't know. I, mean, I think I found her. I think I just yeah. kept sending her. Hey, yeah. and, I'm still hey, here. By the <laughs> way, I've moved to New York. And and, um, and Cheryl Henson was like, oh, don't move to New York. We can't guarantee you anything. Like, you have a job at the Center for Puppetry Arts. And I'm like, yeah, I'm moving to New York. I'm yeah. just doing it. <laughs> Yeah, the other and, hand um, of it, the other side of it is like if you're not in New York, you might miss that opportunity because exactly. you're not in New York. So you yeah. may as well be in New York yeah. if you got the chance. Exactly. So I think I keep sending my my information to to, to Pat Nugent and, and more tapes and things like yeah. that. And she said, "There's a there's a we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna train some women for Sesame Street. We need women on Sesame Street. We're gonna train some. Do you want to come? We'll pay you to be there." Uh, it was like a three hundred dollar a week honorarium to go learn. Um, right. out at Kaufman Astoria. And again, it was Stephanie was there and Lisa Buckley and Heather. And and, um, and uh, so it was eight women. It was it was one uh, one man. Um, I don't know if you remember uh, Donnie Reardon, who we lost yes. far too young. Yes. Um, incredibly, wonderfully talented uh, fellow. Um, and I wish he were still around. But um, yeah. he was the only he was the only guy in this group. <laughs> And uh, they worked with us all day, every day, and uh, uh, and it was a month long. And Alan Troutman started teaching it, and Mac Wilson uh, did a little stint. Um, but people would come in and put us through our paces. Kevin came in whenever he could come in off the floor from Sesame and would do, you know, stretches of time with us. And then people like Brian Henson and Frank Oz would wander in and just, like... <laughs> Give notes. Okay. And yeah. <laughs> it wasn't Good. scary at all. No. Uh, I don't think no. it would be. No. Uh. Um, and then it uh, then when it ended, we each got one little tiny thing to do, some little chicken in the background or something, and then they were like, Okay, we'll call you. Um, can I ask you though, what was that first day when you walked onto Sesame Street, the set of Sesame Street for the first time? What was that like to you? What did that feel like? That felt, um, I, I, I had one of those we're not worthy moments. I, I, I felt like I, I just had an imposter complex that was almost overpowering. You know, oh you just want to, yeah, yeah, you want to walk out again and Jeez. say, like, you, they, they were, um, you know, everyone couldn't have been nicer because they, they 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 needed uh, they needed girls yeah. and and I, and I, you know so we were very welcomed but um at the same time it was it it felt like i i know i know you want me to be here it didn't feel like i was walking into some place that i wasn't wanted yeah. i just felt like you've got the wrong person <laughs> right. you know, yeah. Just, just <laughs> yeah i know what that's like yeah that that's yeah. i think that's fairly common with us because again you're looking at people that are you know might be your hero and yeah. they're like, hey, "Come on in!" Like, I don't know if I can. That's not for me. I'm just watching you. Uh, right. How, how long did it take then before they were like, "All right, you're on. Let's go." Uh, oh, I think I did a penguin in the back of something pretty, pretty, pretty quickly um, because they had they had promised us, you know, a day on the show, and they could only mm -hmm. give us a day on the show um, if we weren't in the union. Right. And um, and so I did my one non non union day, and then I was. Again, I was talking to my dad on the phone, and I and I said, "Yeah, I did my I did my. You can only do one day if you're not in the union." And and um, and uh, and he said, "How much does it cost to join the union?" And I said, "Oh, it's so I, I can't I can't possibly. It's like seven hundred fifty dollars." And he sent me seven hundred fifty dollars to join the union. Uh, and that's um, so sweet. It was so nice. That's so nice. Yeah, he knew was this so was sweet. so important to you. Yeah, and what I mean, not that many parents are going to be that supportive because that was. You know, that's a fair amount of money in 1992 or whatever it was. It's a fair amount of money now. It is, yeah. And um, and he, 
you know, he just wanted me to give it a try, which was so nice. I mean, he and my mom together. I'm saying my dad, but it was, it was, yeah. And uh, so I went over to the after office on Madison Avenue, and I filled out my forms, and I gave yeah. them my money, and 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 then sure enough, like a week later, I'm there sitting on my Apple box observing because I'd gotten permission to come and watch again on Peter and Carmen's suggestion. Like just get it, just get an Apple box, just sit there on the set, just watch what you, just learn what you. And she was like, "This is what I did," and so. Um, so I sat there and I watched and I and I learned and one day Kevin was like, "Are, are you in the union?" I'm like, "Yes, yes, I am in the union, <laughs> Mr. Clash." And he was like, "I need a right hand." And so, um, and it was for a live character called the Grand High Triangle Lover. Uh, so live hand character with Kevin, and um, and he said this and we were setting it all up and then they called lunch. So everyone went down to the cafeteria and I and I went to Peter and I said, "How do you do a live right hand?" How oh, you, you had it? never done. They had covered that. Because that wasn't something. No, ah. we did, we'd done ro- the rod hands, right? We'd done the. Okay. We'd, we'd done ro- rod hands a lot, and we'd done. A, I'd done a little bit of stuff with live hands at the, uh, you know, at the center, and, and just learning a little bit. And right. I, I had a vague theory in my head, but I'd certainly never done it on camera. And here I was doing it with Kevin for production. Yeah. So you know, consider who we're talking about. He <laughs> skipped lunch. Yeah. Took me off into some like empty hallway somewhere and was like, okay, so your wrist has to be the elbow and the sleeve. And he's like, don't pull down. Whatever you do, don't <laughs> pull down. He's just trying to download as much information to you as yeah. quickly as he can before lunch exactly. is over. Oh my uh-huh, gosh. Exactly. And, he, and he's like, don't do too much. In fact, do less, do like half the amount you think you should do. No. 10% of the amount you think you should do. <laughs> and don't pull down. And take the puppet between takes. And I was like, okay. <laughs> all these things. And then, okay, and so oh I, I, I learned all of those things. So we got there, and we're down on the floor, and I'm doing the right hand, and, and it's like a scene with Telly. And so and I knew Marty from the O'Neill, and so it was all kind of okay, and it, it felt all right. But then this character makes an exit stage, not uh, an exit to the left. Okay. And it's a long exit. Uh-huh. And we're on the floor. We're not standing up. And you know what happens. Mm-hmm. You roll over the principal puppeteer yeah. and you wind up lying face down on them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in order to get out of the shot just to, without, yeah. <laughs> yeah. just get, you have to get out of the shot without pulling on them and without oh, letting them go. And there's, and you're lying, you know, on Sesame, because there are humans involved, you're lying on your back on the floor. There's nowhere to go besides just <laughs> rolling over. And, and my, and my instincts at that point were, were screaming, do not, you know, lie on top of this man in front of everyone, but uh, there was nothing else to do. So, so I, so I did, and it was as it turns out, that's was the right thing to do. Yeah, and he got and, out, and he and he made his exit, and I didn't pull on him, and success. that was that. <laughs> success. Wow. So that was kind of that. that was your yeah, that was your first big thing, really, on Sesame Street. I would say just because you know that's that's a high pressure situation. I think in general, Matt, I think that Sesame is incredibly high pressure yes. um, in, in that uh, you don't get very many takes. Mm-hmm. Um, they, the lighting is already set, so there's not these long delays to light. They shoot it soap opera style for anyone you know who doesn't know this. It's like multiple cameras, so they're getting a master and two crosses, and the lights are already set, and they, they, you, know, you read, you very, you know, you block and you shoot and then you move on and you don't, you just don't blow takes there. You just don't do it. And that's how I learned. You know, that's, that was my training. I thought this is how it is. This is how it happens. This is how you do this. Um, And as it happens, there are other places where it's just not that way at all. Like it's (laughs) much, you know, but more relaxed, but But we do have, there's like 15, 14, 15 pages or something like that of, of story that you have to shoot in multiple, oftentimes in multiple locations on the set. And so there's a lot of there is some setting up when you have to do that, but you know they they you just try to get it as quickly as you can, you know yeah, all the pieces yeah. have to fit together very quickly. Right, and you don't and you don't mess up, and you don't no. blow takes. And you oh, don't. I never do. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, yeah, you, I mean. you did have some notable roles. You know, you were saying you know they wanted female performers, and uh, there were characters like Sherry Netherland. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and Mama Bear. Yeah. Were you the first Mama Bear? 
I was the second Mama Bear. Camille was, was the first. Oh, Camille was the first. And Goldilocks. Yeah. You weren't the first Goldilocks, Goldilocks because that again, was also Again, I took over Camille, from Camille. Right? Like, I, I picked yeah. up several of Camille's characters when she when she decided she didn't want to do it anymore. And um, and, and then um, I got a lot of really nice one-off characters. Mm-hmm. I got... Um, I got a. Uh, I remember a really fun one that was a, a princess that was just running around kissing everything, trying to find her prince, <laughs> and um, yeah, and uh, just knowing that her prince had been turned into something, but she didn't know what. And uh, and I, 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 I had a lot of I had a lot of fun with that. And uh, and I remember you having to sort of climb up Big Bird and try to kiss him on the beak and then come back down, and with the camera following it up, That's and great. and Carol being in there and him being so patient, and it was you know, it was really That's fun. Really cool. I remember that um, you were on. On my first big day, we oh. were with John Tartaglia. Was that Crew you, Four? Yeah, you, me, and John were Crew Four. And Kevin. And Kevin, yes, and Ke- of course. And Kevin, yeah, yeah. And we didn't want to be the Crew Three. We wanted to be no, the Crew we Four. Be crew four. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember uh, that. That was a good bit. That was. That was your first thing. Kind of my first big, yeah, speaking thing. Yeah. Yeah, because that was a whole long run. Like was that was fun. the whole runner for the whole story. And there was, yeah. there was, uh, there was. Not singing, but there was kind of it's like rapping, rapping, if you yeah. will. With a I think by of then I'd done my boot camp. I'd done a season of Puzzle Place, and I was coming back uh, off of yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, you were so definitely in, way more experienced, for sure. Right. And I just remember right. you being so sweet and just very supportive. So oh. I remember that. Well, okay, okay, because then, of course, I was the old hand who knew exactly what that's I was doing. Right. Having a, yes, and you were, yeah. The, okay. Yeah. See, see well, yeah, that's right. Along. I forget that. I, I feel like... You and I really grew up together uh, in all of this, but I, I guess I did start like a year before. Yeah, a couple years, yeah. But something like it that. was brief. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I forget but, uh, that. But some other I'm roles, I'm going to go back to some other roles that you did. Okay. Um, Little Murray Sparkles. I yeah. Didn't you... uh, so Stephanie has a character called Elizabeth, and she had this cat, and oh, right. his name was Sparkles. Okay. Yeah, and she named her cat Sparkles, but then Sparkles got lost, and Telly found it and named it Murray. Little Murray was it? Yeah, Little Murray, Little Murray. Yeah, and so um, and then Elizabeth like saw Telly with his new kitten that he loved so much, and they decided that it had to go back to Elizabeth because it's her cat, but that his name would now be Little Murray Sparkles. Right. Yeah, and then and then and that was supposed to just be and, a one-off, uh, but then that little cat showed up. It kept showing up. Before we leave, okay. Sesame Street. There's a special guest who has something to say to you. Alice the Neen, or uh, how I call her Alicia. Oh, Carmencita. Since the 90s <laughs> that we worked together um, at the Puzzle Place. We spent mm-hmm. three seasons together going to Los Angeles and having one of our incredible times of our lives. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we, it so, was so, so much fun. Amazing. So special. Um, but I can tell you that for me to see Alice working was so inspiring. She taught me so much, and not just oh. of the look of the puppet, but the detail orientated and everything. So I admire that uh, so much from her and, and how secure and, 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 and intelligent and and powerful female performer that she is I, I i i keep learning from her and her performances so i'm a fan number one another one and i wanted to tell you this story <laughs> and i don't know if she remembers but she saved my life <laughs> and we were at the hollywood ball performing with sesame street for the 4th of July. Oh, yes. This is a good and story. And we all had all, you know, songs together. And uh, Rosita had a solo song. And Alice, thank God that Alice was with me. She was helping me with her Rosita's right hand. And I start singing and my microphone was not working. So <laughs> the conductor grabbed an extra microphone, handheld microphone that he had. And he said, no, no problem, Rosita, I have a microphone for you. And he gave it to Rosita, a handheld um, microphone. And obviously I'm like, oh, okay. So Rosita grabbed the microphone, kind of laughed very nervously, and I put the microphone down. 
Alice, with not hesitation, grabbed that microphone with he, with her left hand because the right one was helping me, and she managed to put the microphone right in my mouth without blocking my monitor, and uh, she saved my life. So I wanted to say that thank you again for being there next to me. I was so glad that I was panicking with you there. <laughs> oh, uh, Carmen Sita, she um, is just the best, isn't she? That was a really, fu- I, you know, I, I hadn't, I hadn't entirely forgotten that story, but it's nice to be reminded. Uh, the uh, the cameras are on and the jumbotrons are huge, and she was holding this microphone and kind of looking at it, like half the audience. <laughs> understands the problem (laughs) and the other half doesn't (laughs) yeah and so you start hearing these little laughs out in the house so she just like puts it down her pants basically (laughs) is what she did and it was solved problem solved yeah why did you leave sesame street i was very very interested in the creature shop at that point and i was getting a lot of opportunities with creature shop um going back to the you know sort of 80s early 90s i was so keen on dark crystal first of all i loved it loved it loved it i was just you know i was very young teen when it came out and i went in the theaters and i watched it over and over and over again and um just loved it so much um you know labyrinth some but then another one that i went back and watched over and over again this kind of a deep cut did you ever see a movie called dream child I didn't. I'm familiar with it, but I never saw the movie. It was a, a a really dark take on Alice in Wonderland, and I loved those creatures. They were they were they were ugly and detailed and creepy, and their eyes rolled around, and they're just like the, all that they did so they did so much, and it was so puppety. Like the Griffin and the Mock Turtle were were um, were next to an ocean that was clearly just a sheet of plastic with a fan running under mm-hmm. it. But it worked so beautifully well. And then this little girl was in there with them, talking to them, and they're massive and ugly and hovering over her. And 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 I just, I, I was, you know, I was, I don't know, maybe like 16 or something. I remember being able to drive and get to the local art house theater to go see it again and again. Yeah. Um, and then sort of the th- third one that really got me interested in all that was Babe. Um, again, one of my favorite movies ever made, and uh, just the, the the characters in that and the way that they were able to, um, you know, to sort of double for real animals and bring the bring yeah, to Yeah, I mean, did they to, must to have matched, and, right? They matched uh, real animals and puppets. There were... Yes. They, they would go yeah. back and forth, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. it's real animals and so puppets together. So well done. So well it's done. It's so well done, and it's so beautiful. And I was so interested in all that. And then um, it was re- I was still I was still living in New York, and I was still doing Sesame. But I got the chance to do the Country Bears. Um, I had this opportunity with Creature Shop, I, uh, and they were they were doing a lot of features. They were doing mm-hmm. they were doing quite a few, and I had turned down a few already for Sesame Street. Um, and uh, that was something, but it was. I, I was really, really interested in it, and I like to, um, you know, there are new, there were new challenges there, um, and it felt like there was something totally new to learn. I'm, I'm, I'm from California, uh, and I, I did eventually want to live, live back here again. Um, I was, uh, I was, you know, married at the time, and both of our families were in California. Um, including um, including my stepson, who was a small child then, and we weren't seeing enough of him. And also, 9-11 uh, happened, and New York felt a little bit like I didn't want to be far away from my family. And and so all right at the same time, all those factors uh, lined up, and and, uh, and I thought, here's... Here are all these reasons, plus a really interesting new challenge with something that I want to do and that I really see a future in. Basically, it was the same way that they did uh, Ninja Turtles and um, Dinosaurs. Right. The technique where there's a person inside the suit wearing a, a helmet, basically, that's mm-hmm. the head of the character that's all covered with, with servos. And then there's a puppeteer on the outside that has these crazy input devices that are basically running all the servos and you're playing it almost like an instrument but you're also saying the dialogue live while you're 
blinking the eyes and moving the ears and moving the mouth with servos that are can sometimes be 20 feet away from you. Yeah. And um, how, how many different and, controls are on on that? Like how many different facial moves did, were you in control of at one time? Uh, 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 20? Yeah. Wow. I mean, I'm sure you don't use so, all 20 at one time. You, there must be a little bit right. of finesse to it to make it look authentic and like it's a real character rather than just some sort of jumble of ticks and <laughs> blinks and right. things like that. Right. right. Well, you, I mean, you set, you set each of those expressions, like you set the neutral of where the eyelids are, you know, the neutral of your, uh, of your character's eyelids say everything about the character when, when, uh, you know, are they a little bit sleepy? Are they wide? Are they alert all the time? And, and you, as a puppeteer, you choose where that neutral is and you lock it in. And then from there you program a blink and where do those upper and lower lids meet? Are they a little higher on the eyeball? Are they a little lower on the eyeball? You decide that wow. you, and, and you, and you, cr- you sort of build the character's expressions and then you fire the expressions with these input devices when, when you'd be in one of the expressions is just jaw open closed, but you also have kind of an ooh and an E that all come mechanically with a little latex skin over it and then they punch those skins with all little individual hairs and it's extraordinary I, I, I could geek out on this for yeah, another well, here's a question the rest how, of the- how do you what is it what is it that you're t- touching or pushing to make like eye blink is it something that is on that you're holding like a joystick on a game yes. like what's they're, it similar to they're, they're, well, they're purpose-built input devices. One kind of goes around your hand and, and, and picks up the open close yep. uh, of, your, of your hand puppet that style. That I'm familiar with. Yeah, it's like a puppet, yeah. but it's, you know, it does a little foam or something, and then that moves the mouth. But what are the other Right, and then, and then on your left hand is where you mostly do the upper half of the face, the eyes and ears. Uh, you have a large joystick that has four small push-pull joysticks attached to it, plus there's a twist on it as well. So that, those are all the different potential signals that you can send to your machine. And you could just combine those signals in the same way that like somebody could plays a guitar chords or something. I got it. That sounds yeah. hard. <laughs> that sounds I, I, difficult. I love, I love it. I really, really do. And Did that's you pick how it up they, quickly? You know, that's, um, I think so. I was actually trained on that for something before uh, Country Bears. It was a show, it was a sitcom on ABC called Aliens in the Family. Yeah. And they trained me for that. And again, I got I got a nice lessons a month long out in, out in Los Angeles with um, a puppeteer who had been on uh, dinosaurs and Ninja Turtles named uh, David Greenaway. And he he taught us uh, he taught us how to you know there are two two phases to it. There's the programming of the expressions. There's the setting of the neutrals, and there's the creation of the expressions. And then there's the performance of it. Right. And you have to work with a suit performer. I was lucky enough to have in her first role inside a suit. Where I had the the marvelous Misty Rosas, who um, has gone on to be a very regular performer with Henson, and is now all over the Mandalorian in a bunch wow. of different characters. But she had been an Olympic level gymnast and was fearless and strong and just tough as nails and would just wear this enormous furry suit with this <laughs> head with these little machines moving all around her head and face. And I imagine, I mean, I know and, you can hear them. You can hear the... Yeah. Because I can hear them in you, Sweden. Yes. You can hear the eyes going... It's not yeah. the same, but... Like, I imagine taping radio control cars all, all over your head. You. <laughs> and And then, yeah. you know, running across a set and jumping uh, and picking up props and... Just yeah, looking through the mouth. Yeah, just looking through the mouth. Uh, I'm going to... Yeah. While you're in L.A., Carmen mentioned Puzzle Place, and, and I, I do want to say... You know, you were one of the leads on Puzzle Place. You were Julie, and you were Zizzle or Sizzle. Zizzle. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, and and I came in and got to, we got to play when Peter was doing. I think Peter was off doing Bear in the Big Blue House. So I came in to Bear do Bear in the Big Blue House, Sky and Nuzzle yeah. for the third season, and we just had a blast. I had so much fun. Yeah, yeah. And they they were they they looked at a bunch of they looked at several different different people for that, and they were like, I don't know, they're all good. Who do you want? And I was like, Matt, did you know that? Did you know I no, picked you? No. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. thanks. That's awesome. They let me. They let me choose. That's great. You were. You were awesome. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. I did not know well, that. Well, because because we had to play those characters off of each yeah. other. Yeah, yeah, and that was you know, so much was, fun. So that was. Yeah, it really was. That you was, know, I mean, I mean, if it couldn't be Peter, I of course, if it couldn't be Peter, I'm glad that it was you know, me again. You know, yeah. No, no, I'm just, I just want to work his name into conversation as much as I can because I love him. Look, I know he, he, uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, Okay. We've got more with Alice Deneen, but first we're going to ask a puppeteer about not puppets. Ask the puppeteer 
puppeteer about not puppets. On today's installment of Ask a Puppeteer About Not Puppets, we're talking with Sesame Street and Muppet performer Peter Lintz. Peter Lintz, did you have a high school crush? Oh, yeah. What can you say about your high school crush? Anything? I, I, I always had a crush on a different girl. <laughs> oh. In high school? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there was, oh, there's, there's quite a few. I've got all these names. <laughs> oh, okay, well, okay. maybe we'll just leave it um, there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, I had a lot of love to give. <laughs> <laughs> and that is asking a puppeteer about not puppets. Ask the puppeteer about not puppets. We're back with Alice Deneen for one last round of interview stuff. I'm going to try, I'm just jumping around here, Alice, just because I want, I don't want to, miss anything, but there's so much to talk to you about. So I'm, I'll go with uh, Muppet stuff right now. So you've okay. done a ton of actual, like, who are now the Disney Muppets over the years, including, so I'm going to yes. just name little things, and then maybe you can just shout something out that maybe comes to mind about them. So uh, you did some stuff on Muppets Tonight. Only a few days. Uh, Muppets Tonight was shooting while we were training for Aliens in the Family uh, at Raleigh Studios. So we were in the soundstage next door mm. taking lessons while they were shooting Muppets Tonight on the same lot, and uh, they pulled us in a few times. That's pretty good. Okay, Muppets from Space. That was in North Carolina. Uh, yeah, that was in North Carolina, and yeah, I had to step away from Sesame to do that, but that was, uh, but but it was such a great adventure, and um, that was where I really got to know. Uh, so really, really got to know Bill. Um, and uh, there was there was a lot to do in terms of uh, all of the, you know, the whole panoply of Muppet characters, and it was so. That was the first time I really got. To, I mean, I'd, I'd performed with with the classic Muppets before, but that was the first time I got to just live with them for an extended yeah. period of time. And I, you know, you rotate around and you do them all, and That's it's right, so yeah. fun. It's yeah, so fun. I'm guessing a similar thing happened on Very Merry Muppet Christmas Movie. Yeah, yep. And uh, that Wizard was yeah. Oz. That was up in Vancouver. Things Muppet like Wizard that. of Oz. There was that. Yeah, there were all of those long form projects. Yeah, that I got to do, and that was. Well, Eric was there, but you weren't there with Muppets yet, were you? You were still doing Sesame. Yeah, yeah. okay. But but Eric was Eric at was least there on from Wizard like, of Oz. Yes, and I came in about right. seven years later. Oh, was it that long? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah it was. I, I have my time. My timeline is all I know. was all messed up. But there was a series of those sort of longer form projects, and then there was one I didn't do, which was Letters to Santa, which because that right. shot in New York. That shot in New York. Yeah, I did do that one. Mm-hmm. But but back to you. Bear in the Big Blue House. Okay, I I did the very very beginning of that. Um, I did I did Grandma Flutter for for a little bit, but again there was a conflict. I think the conflict was with cousin Skeeter. Ah, yeah, that'll be so, under our non Muppet projects that we'll discuss. Our non Muppet pro- there's there's yeah because there's a lot but of those. This too. podcast is about Sesame and Muppet projects. It is, but we cover it all. Stuff, we just right? try to we cover it all. Uh, I'll go. Oh, Kermit Swamp Years. That was fun. Yeah, that you were in, in Orlando. Uh, that was in Orlando, and that was uh, sort of a, a Kermit's origin story, yeah. or not not only origin story, like a childhood story. And, and you get to meet some of his childhood friends, and and uh, yeah, it was Joey Mazzarino and yeah. John Kennedy, and uh, and I yeah, I played a, a jog. Um, they kept my voice on the snake, like uh, there was a there was a very villainous snake in a tank. Uh, in a pet store, but uh, they did they did dub me over for the dog because they wanted a, a, an African American actress, which is fine. I've been dubbed over many times, was dubbed over by children or whoever. Yeah, but um, I don't mind. I feel like it's still my performance. Yeah, so that's right. Uh, yeah. We'll go with the 2011 film called The Muppets. The you, Muppets. You played the that? Afghan Hound. You had like a there's a lot there's like a whole featured line. Uh, she orders you. a pizza. Yes. Yeah, she's ordering a pizza that's and a phone right. bank. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I haven't, uh, I haven't gotten a ton of speaking parts with 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 Muppets. There just haven't actually been that many available, uh, and and you know because the same, you know, it's the same characters doing. Yeah. There aren't that many one offs. There just aren't that many like fun little one offs in in the classic Muppet stuff. Well, I mean, and, and again, I'm fine with that because it's it's uh, it's so fun to move around and embody all those characters. And you know, you if you know when two characters are in the same scene like Piggy and Fozzie you 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 do get to act the scene um and it's you know it's fun to just be yeah. those characters and take on yeah, yeah it is. But now in the Muppets it. TV show you were there mm-hmm. and you even yes. did get to you played a character that was in a, it was one of those one offs but she was kind of a yeah. featured she was one of the storylines in the show uh Oh yeah she was pig, in this Piggy Alinda, fan girl Alinda the yeah. Alinda the pig uh, 
yeah, yeah. She was a little little, little fangirl for 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 Miss Piggy, and, and, yeah. and Miss Piggy develops a tiny little bit of a of a heart, knowing that she's <laughs> actually crazy. inspired somebody. Yeah, I actually do remember shooting that and and seeing you and just uh, watching you, and uh, you were, I just thought you were great. You were fantastic. Oh, thank so you, good. thank you so much. I yeah, I remember. Um, Trying to, you know, I, m- I remember struggling with how girly or not that character should be, you know, like how, how uh, I- I- there were a um, bunch of different ways to to go with it, and I, mm-hmm. I think I went pretty straightforward with like teenage fan girl. Yeah, which so, it was great. I yeah. thought it was really good. Uh, Thank you so much. And let's uh, we'll talk about uh, Muppets Take the Bowl. That was a live show that we did that at was the live Hollywood show. Bowl. And again, mm-hmm. it's like one of those things where because there were so it was really the Muppet Show, a live version of the Muppet Show. And so everybody was just kind of running around doing a lot of different things. What were some of the things that you did? I know one of the things that you did because you helped Kermit with Happy Feet, which was awesome. Oh yeah, that was really fun. Yeah, we got to yeah. Drew, 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 and I did that. Um, I also did. Oh, yeah. uh, I did conducting for Pepe when yeah. he was conducting the orchestra. Yeah, yeah. That was really fun. Yeah. And um, and then I did one of the chickens in Bohemian Rhapsody that starts the whole thing with with uh, with with Gonzo. Yeah. And. Uh, and then, um, oh, I, my favorite thing, I got to play guitar for Janice. Oh, and we yeah. We do her, hand, you know, we do that long set with the oh Mayhem. Oh, my gosh, yes. And we'd done it in Outside Lands as well, yeah. I guess, before that. And it's just, it's so fun to do the Mayhem live, yeah. a live set. It's like mayhem. you're in a band. It really is like, like you're in a band. It's like being in a band. <laughs> yeah. It really is so, so much fun. Uh, yeah, so Julianne and I learned Floyd and Janice's guitar parts, and we really tried to figure out what the hand, what the fingering would be, and, and get every, you know, and we wanted to yeah. make sure that they were different, you know, that they were doing different things, because they were playing different tracks. And we're like, oh, yeah. we can't just be, like, waving their hands in front of their guitars. Like, we wanted to make sure that when Janice was playing, Janice was playing, and when Floyd, so we, yeah. we, we, really, we really made sure... Well, we all, all of us who, who quote unquote, I'm making air quotes, play the instruments mm-hmm. are, um, I think we're very, very careful about trying to make it look real. And it's so fun. Yeah, it's that's, so that's fun. What, that's the fun part of it is the, the challenge of making it look like they're really playing. Uh, and then you couldn't do the Muppets Take the O2. Why couldn't no, you do the Muppets I, Take the O2, Alice? I, <laughs> I got to come and sit in the audience. I know. Uh, so if you could come and sit in the audience, why, why? couldn't you do the show? Right. Why? It seems so strange. What were you doing I in London? Go, I could not go to the rehearsal for that because I was shooting the Dark Crystal. In um, Yeah, I, I, I got uh, to live out uh, just such a dream job. Unbelievable. I still can't believe it. It yeah. was insane. Um, I've never worked so hard. I've never been so tired. <laughs> and I'm a single mom, and I've never been so tired. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And your son was and, there with uh, you in London, right? He came with you? He was. He went to school there. He got on his little school bus in his little English school uniform in his little yeah. school that was divided into four houses like Harry Potter, and, oh. and he did his whole thing. And he comes from a big, like, L.A. public school, and, and then he's in this tiny school. Like some of the buildings were 300 years old, and oh, wow. he's in his little uniform. And oh, it was it was uh, it was quite a, I think very memorable for him. I hope so. I'm I hope sure. it was a, a good experience. And yeah. meanwhile, you're um, having a but memorable I was time. busy doing my own thing. That's right. Yeah. So, so tell mm-hmm. us for those of people that haven't seen Dark Crystal: Age of Resistance, currently on Netflix. Uh, what mm-hmm. what did you do in this show? What, like, why was this such a big deal for you? Well, um, like I said, I got super obsessed with uh, with those creature shop things that Jim was doing in the 80s. Yeah. And uh, I loved, loved, loved them. I thought they were so weird and wonderful and inventive and and just there's nothing else like that. And Dark Crystal was an entire feature with no humans in it. And, and it was... Uh, I... I don't know why it spoke to me so profoundly, but it did. And I just, I loved Kira. I loved her. And, and I, and I, I just never thought, I never thought that, that, uh, I would get to even, you know, see those puppets in person. And then I got to, you know, work at the center and there was a mystic and, and also a couple podling, podling musicians were there too. And I just felt so privileged to be in the same room with them. And I thought, okay, that's, my life is complete. I've seen a dark crystal <laughs> puppet for real. And I mean, this is like, little did you know, little did you know, 
<laughs> yeah. You 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 know me. I don't gush about movies or TV or fandom, no. or I don't wear no. character T-shirts. I don't have collections of action figures. I don't. No. But I'm like a hardcore. <laughs> 80s creature shop fan oh. and um and it's uh it's the kind of thing that um i got to do the gelfling princess brea you know she's sort of this the spiritual descendant of of kira although timeline wise she comes before um but you know obviously production wise she came after so i just watched what kathy mullen did with Kira, and I went back and I got to revisit one of my favorite things, but with a completely different eye. I thought, now what is she actually doing? Mm. And where is Kathy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How yeah. can she I'll be hidden? <laughs> Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh and 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 how is you know how is how is how's how's Kathy moving? How is she putting that again like how is she putting that brain in that? What is she thinking? What is uh you know what's her level of curiosity? What's her level of um you know fear versus curiosity? You know what where what is this because this is this is the same species of creature and it's um also you know as we learned they were they're they're sort of divided into seven different cultures, seven different clans of Gelfling. And um, and they are culturally very different in their dress and in their weapons and in their jewelry and their their and their customs. So uh, of the three hero Gelflings, Brea is the one that comes from the same clan as as uh, Kira, as we as we as we understood it. So, so I, I look, I learned, I sorted out for myself every decision that Kathy made, like who this was, because I thought she established this. Yeah. She established, um, you know, who, what, the only, the only individual of this of this culture that exists. And then we, you know, created and when I say we created, unbelievable artisans created, um, and then handed us these exquisite objects but there were many many from that from that clan and um and they all had the variations in uh you know in their personalities and so on but we tried to decide okay how does a vaprin behave and then you know how does a stonewood behave and how does a grotten behave was this and, something that um, you were doing like everybody in like all the all the performers were doing or was this did this go with did, did the director did the producers were you all sitting around with the writers and saying like well there's this group of characters and this is how they act or was it just among the performers uh we talked about it in read throughs mm -hmm. um somewhat some you know with it with the director and the writers um and then we had we had a lot of sidebar conversations with writers and uh and with uh, we were lucky enough to have all three frouds there with us oh um, Toby, Wendy, and of course Brian Froud, who who um, designed the original thing. But uh, Toby was the head of the whole creature shop, and he had actually done a lot of the designs for the different, you know, sort of sort of the he had done little maquettes for the different clans, and and um, he was a great sort. Like we had the source there. Yeah, we had the, that's great. We had the sort of the peculiarities of these different species and these sort of different because not only were there these different species that live and throb, but then there are these different ethnicities within the species. Yeah. And so we were sorting out all of that and, and, um, and, and just what their traditions were and what their cultures were and how they would behave and how, you know, and like the Vaprins are very dignified and, uh, and they're very um, formal and they value education and they all, you know, all these things that and are so, well, completely foreign to the other clans. Yeah, so while a, a fantasy world was created by Jim and mm -hmm. Brian Froud back in the day, you guys took it kind of to another level. Uh, well, we were the end of a very long chain of doing that. Yeah. The depth of research and decision making and world building that's in the writing mm -hmm. is extraordinary. And then, of course, we were lucky enough to have Brian design them again, yeah. and uh, and and Toby there to build and interpret, and Wendy was there, and um, and just just the incredible, like all of these builders and prop makers and armorers and hair people and all, and they were coming off of doing all the Harry Potter movies and all that, you know. So they had this incredible kind of fantasy skill sets, and they just brought it all. They just yeah. Brought it. it. My mind is blown because seeing the dark crystal and seeing the just the vast detail of every frame of that film and really every character even is so detailed. Even that, and then on top of that is this whole other creation that feels very much like that original world, but also something 
that feels v- um, vibrant and new. I love that. I love yeah. it. I yeah, I loved it. I loved every single day of of being there. It was it was exhausting. You came to visit, yeah. I know too. You came out there, we did. and I remember you being actually very close to where we were working. Like you, yeah. you stay there for a long time, and they you know yeah, we, and, we and, toured uh, the the we toured where they were making uh, costumes and puppets, and we saw tons yeah. of cool and things. It was, oh, it was my gosh! It was, all together, yeah, it was all it was in the all same building. There. It wasn't scattered in, no. in houses and being shipped in, and it was uh, it was all there under one roof, and we could walk from place to place. And, and very and, cool. Yeah, yeah you walk from one set really. to another set to another set. Anything. But this also sounds like your wheelhouse, you know, creating this world, and you know, not so many things. Like everything is kind of coming together for you to be doing this particular project that had been so important to you. Is that how you felt about it? That's very much how I how I how I felt about it. And I, you know, I was saying, um, you know, I was saying to my mom, like, uh, yeah, I'm going to pull Ben out of school. I'm going to take him all the way across the country. I'm going to put him someplace where he doesn't know anybody, and I'm going to be gone all day every day. And that's what I'm going to do. And she's like, couldn't you just do the next job? Is this really going to lead to something? Like, is that the best thing for? I'm like, no. Everything has been leading to this moment. Uh, I. I I'm hoping it'll be a good experience for him. I'm hoping that he'll remember that and it'll be interesting. But I, you know what? Whatever the end result there is, I'll make it up to him because I'm doing <laughs> this. This is the thing you have to do. Yeah. yeah. She was like, is this going to lead to something else? I'm like, no, no. Everything has been leading to this. Yeah. No, this isn't leading to anything else. This is, this the, is thing. the thing. Oh my gosh, we yeah. said that at the same time. Uh, yeah, this is yeah. the thing. Uh, you know, was there anything else about Dark Crystal that you wanted to say? I could talk for the next week about all the things I want to say about okay. Dark Crystal, but mostly I want to say how incredible the fellow performers are. I thought that uh, you, you got working with 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 you got with you and you know and Bill and and you know Peter and Barty and Pam and like all of the, all the people that I grew up with and like such amazing 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 set of puppeteers and we're so privileged to be to be in that community. There's another one. There's another world. It's like we found. It's like I found another planet. Yeah, <laughs> uh, of am- another community of amazing puppeteers yeah. over there. You know, and there's Louise and Warwick and Dave and oh Helen gosh. and Cat and Becky and like it's just it's they're so they're so good and they're so wonderful. Yeah. They're such amazing people. And it seems like oh, that's a ton of people, but it's even even still between you know um, the American puppeteers and the English puppeteers, there aren't really that many. You know, you could no. you could put us all no. in a medium sized room. Probably. You could, you could, Maybe. and uh, and and there would there would still be space yeah. for like mm-hmm. some. Yeah. yeah. All right, so we're mm-hmm. going to talk about non Muppet projects just kind of quickly. We've talked about some of them, okay? But uh, well, yeah. this was this was a Sesame project, but Big Bag. I remember doing Big Bag with you. Big Bag. We yeah, did that in Orlando. That was fun. And I was Joey's right hand, Orlando. and you were uh, the Sophie, the the uh, Sophie, the girl, yep. the character. The, uh, yeah, was... yeah, I got to. Yeah, the, I remember the music on that being really fun. Yeah, a lot of good singing, good songs. Well, singing and dancing with the puppets, yeah. it was fun. Uh, yeah. Cousin Skeeter. Uh, yeah, I did Skeeter's hands for Drew Massey, uh, and we um, was that a Nickelodeon uh, show? That Nickelodeon. That was a Nickelodeon yeah. show. One of the one of the really terrific elements of that show was that that's where we really got to know and work with and form a team with Scott. Johnson and Jurgen Ferguson. Oh yeah, um, we were the four of us were on that show for a couple of years, and we really we made a team, and we're still so delighted when we get to oh, work together and Scott see and each other. And Jurgen and Scott were were with us in they were both on Dark Crystal. Oh yeah, so. that's right. Yeah, mm. yeah, they came to Lin- they came to London. And for Drew, that. Drew's just the so. best. He's a great guy. Drew's amazing. Yeah, him. yeah. Uh, let's talk about Crank Acres just briefly. I mean, when you're on that show. Comedians record their phone calls, prank calls, and then you guys take right. them. And a lot of times it's kind of elevated in some way. The, the action of whatever they're talking about becomes elevated or in some way it's blown up bigger than life. Is that right? Uh, yes. There, there's often, um, yeah, they, they, will, they will create an environment in which the call mm-hmm. occurs. Um, and it's often, you know, just just a weirder version of what it really is, yeah. like a convenience store or a florist or something. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't love working blue. It's one of the reasons I don't like necessarily didn't really delve into the improv and the puppet up mm-hmm. and so on. It's just not. It's just something I get like embarrassed by. But and when we do that, some on crank for sure. Yeah. Um, I don't let my parents watch it. Um, <laughs> uh, other than that. Yeah. <laughs> 
other than that, yeah. if I can just, with that little asterisk, I can say it is such a great way to um, work on creating character. Just yeah. one after another after another. Like two sides of each call, uh, all different characters every time. Like there are some repeating characters that come in, but I tend to like to do the background characters and the marks and the, and the, the ones that are... That are the one-offs, and you just every single one of them has to be an individual, and they, you know, they create them in the puppet shop with the features and the costumes that are, and they're, they're all just distinctive individuals every time, and then you just have to figure out how to embody that three times a day, wow. every day. That's pretty cool. And it's and it's just great. It's a great it's a great workout, and it's and it's fun, and it's got its own set of challenges. You know, I love sinking my teeth into yeah. stuff. Uh, but before we leave this little section, we will talk about uh, some. You've done some stuff. You mentioned that you had little baby Bennett. With you, I had little baby Bennett in with Chicago me when yes, when we were doing a wonderful, also non Muppet and Sesame mm-hmm. show, which which you absolutely need to mention because you oh, were, yeah. did many brilliant, brilliant one off characters got to come and play on, that show. on Jack's big yeah, yeah Jack's big music show. Yeah. Um, you are with the Spiffy Boys. I, I still. You're the Spiffy Boys. I still remember Leonard the Country Squirrel oh, so fondly. Yeah, uh, but you were Mary. You were Mary, um, and she was in every I episode. Didn't Mary. She was one of the main characters yeah. on that, and it was truly one of the one of the favorite projects ever. I that was a, such a joy. I am a big, big, big David Redman fan. Yeah, it's so much fun to work with David and with Adam. It's just joyous. It's just. I get so yeah. excited every time they're like, "Hey, you want to come over and do something?" I'm like, "Yes, I do." Yes, absolutely. I know. And you got to do you got to do Jack's Big Music Show and Bunny Town and Bunny Town, which again yeah. was back yeah. in the UK. You shot that in the UK, didn't you? Back in the UK, we shot that in the UK. Yeah, before and, uh, Dark and I got to way before Dark, long, long before, and with only a few of the same people. Remarkably, mm. yeah, it was um, Jack's Big Music Show came first, and uh, we did three seasons of it, I think. Mm-hmm. Maybe two. Ben was only around for the last one, um, and and my mom came to Chicago, and, and and he was there in the green room, and it was yeah, it was it was it was really great. So that that marks it exactly in time. Mm-hmm. But um, that one was so much fun because it was so small, you know, it was so self-contained. It was in that tiny room. Yeah, the sets and were small, and the puppets. The sets were small. were small. The puppets are teeny tiny, yeah. and it was an interesting way of working because. Puppeteers in general are kind of a loud performative bunch. <laughs> um, there's a lot of uh, there's mouths. a lot of singing. There's a <laughs> lot of chit chat. There's a lot of you know. Yeah. But um, the main cast on that one it was it was me. It was John Kennedy and David Rudman. Yeah. None of us known for being loud mouths. No. And we would shoot a scene, and then you know he would sort of softly say cut because he was performing and directing, and then there would just be silence. <laughs> And he'd think about it for a minute. You know, he'd sort of, that's just the room would be just quiet. He'd think about whether it was good or not. He'd like, without any saying anything, he'd look over. <laughs> like, we might give him a little nod or like a tiny little shake of the head. Yeah. Oh, something man. like that. And then that, and then he'd make the decision as to whether to do another take or not. Yeah. And he'd sort of quietly, okay, all right, let's go again. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> there's just, there was just silent. Yeah. And, and he and, storyboarded and everything. Just, he storyboarded all of everything. the... So it wasn't yeah. a three-camera shoot. It was a single-camera shoot. And he would single get camera. the wides, and then he would go in and get close-ups. And, but it was all... Yeah. He would only get what he needed. If, if I remember correctly, he only gets what he thinks he needs, because he storyboarded everything out. Right. He knows what it's going to look like, right. which I love. Yeah. He doesn't shoot it ten different ways, and, no. then, and then decide he's going to put it together in post. No, he already knows what he knows. it's supposed to look like, and he shoots what he needs, and then we move on, and, and then he goes home to his lovely family. Yeah, which I, I, I love and that. yeah, uh, yeah, we only only a few times went late into the night, and uh, and that was usually for technical stuff. Mm-hmm. No, he was very he's yeah, I, and I just love that way of working. I, I do too. Yeah, and he he's the guy that I you know he said the best idea wins. Anybody? I mean, I know that he kind of got that from Jim. But he carries right. that through, and that's how he runs his productions, very much, I'm told, like like Jim ran his productions. Yeah, I remember him saying a few times when we would just do something, or like, I, I remember doing the feet for Eric on this little bird, and, and, and like he was singing this song, and he just like does this weird little pose on one thing, and, and I, I don't know what I was doing, I was just like making something up, and he was like, that's so weird, what is that? What are you doing? Keep it. <laughs> Keep it. That's great. Keep it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but just do it. Uh, you did Bunny Town, and not only were you a puppeteer, but you also wrote on that show. I did. I did write on that. Yeah, 
Yeah, and that was really really fun uh, because you know, uh, well, Adam and I, we're yeah. the we're, we're like. You know, we we like a lot of the same stuff. Like we grew up in the same era, and like we have all the same cultural references, um, which is amazing. You get a year or two out from somebody like in their high school years, and everything's different. Yes. The TV shows and the music and everything. So we just like we're really on the same page about a lot of stuff, and so it was really fun to collaborate with him. He would often like come up with the ideas, and we'd sort of beat out the, the story things, and then he'd 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 put it into kind of outline form and then then I write in some dialogue and maybe some song lyrics and like we just bat it back and forth and it was really cool. it was really fun and nice I yeah I know Was that the first it's, time that you were a writer on you know like for any kind of puppet stuff or anything like that Uh no I wrote for Skeeter Oh you did not Yeah and I written a few things for uh for Henson since then How, how does that happen do they yeah. come to you or do you go to them and say hey guys if you I'm ready to write something, you know, put me to work. <laughs> well, for Jack's Big Music Show, I was totally jet-lagged, and we were at a recording session at Terry Fryer's house, and I was three-quarters asleep, like, lying face down on the couch, and they were trying to come up with a rhyme for a song lyric. And I, like, sat up and, like, just said, blah, 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 boom, and they were like, hey, hey do you want to write? <laughs> <laughs> like, literally, yeah, that was that's it. That's good. That's the best way to, for it to happen, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that maybe the 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 issue there was that um, they just needed another set of hands, and and yeah. and and by then we all knew that we were on the same wavelength with the characters, and also feeling like very just very simpatico with uh, their sensibilities, yeah. which which I which I do, you know, I've always I've always really appreciated the the spiffy vibe. Oh yeah. Me too. I love it. I really yeah. do. Oh, and we did that. Uh, we did that Scooby Doo. We did that Scooby Doo thing, thing, which was so much fun. And then they, that was we great. all got dubbed over. It was silly, and you know, it was silly yeah, and fun. I did too. And it was, and it was, uh, it was a, uh, you know, the, that group of you and me and Matt and Peter Steffi yeah. all sort of started together yeah. and have all sort of grown up with it. And, and, and we yeah, and we've, t- yeah, we've, we don't. Um, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't all get to work together in that particular group enough. I don't see yeah. Stephanie enough. I uh, like, like, but just when you do the East Coast West Coast thing, it's it's often very, very separate yeah. groups. There are a number of people who flow back and forth, but but um, I'm not sure people realize how, quite how bifurcated it is. Uh, and uh, you did, you've done so many things, Alice. I can't get this all. I'm trying. I'm racing to get through things. So I will say that. You were a puppet captain on uh, yes. Jim Henson's Turkey um, Hollow. On Turkey Hollow, that was super fun. That was Canadians. Oh, so there's another, there's another group, group of, of there's people. another planet of oh puppeteers. My gosh. Yeah, They're everywhere. I know. <laughs> um, I love me some Canadians. Uh, they uh, that was in Vancouver. So and we were outside. We shot a lot oh. of it outside, either on location in a in a um, in this great old farmhouse or just out in the woods. And yeah. it was it's mar- it was temperate rainforest, just green and. But what was the day to day like for you on a sh- on a, a show like Turkey Hollow? Uh, well, it's it's you know it's getting there and and uh, knowing how many different setups we're going to have that day was often quite a lot, and knowing where to put monitors and where to put the the, the people. Um, there were often these four creatures that were often very close together, and um, we often needed to. Travel and uh, you know they were very sort of animal-like, and they would pop up and then drop down and then appear again, you know, three feet away. And you know it was it was uh, you could, we couldn't be on rollies or things necessarily very easily because of uh, we were on the dirt, we were in the forest, yeah. and and um, so it was a lot of problem solving and working with Kirk Thatcher who was directing and then lots of figuring stuff out with the grips where to set monitors that they wouldn't be seen and there were you know I was constantly getting the greensman in there like put a big fern right here because we have to hide an enormous monitor <laughs> right. and, yeah. and figuring things out like uh, like there were some there were some tree branches that needed to um, you know when she sang to it they needed to kind of dance and, and sway around and and you know they said we'll go in all green and we'll just put green rods on these and then we'll you know, we'll paint you guys out, and it'll be an effect shot. And I was like, mm, we wound up putting, uh, we wound up, you know, weighting them like marionettes because uh-huh. I had this marionette experience, and then um, taking fishing line, and we're again, we're in a real forest, and so I tied, I tied the lines to weights and threw them over real branches that were up above yeah. that were just higher, and we just pulled on those lines and marionetted these branches, and we didn't have to do an effect shot. There was no green. You saved the movie. There was nothing. I, I didn't save the movie, but I saved them some money. You saved money. them some money, but yes. The, the reason I tell that story is because it's just like old school 
puppet stuff yeah. from you know hun- hundreds of years old, and they wanted to use their newfangled technology, and it just wasn't necessary. <laughs> it was not necessary. You know, it's just yeah. I love being uh, able to do something practically in camera where you're like, there it is. It's I right there. love that. Yeah. Would mm-hmm. you do yeah. uh, puppet yeah. captain stuff again if given the chance? Um, I. I I would, I would. I have, uh, again, like like some of the travel, it's something I've been um, turning down recently just because too much is too much. And my, you know, my kid's in high school and he was in lockdown and he, you know, he needs some attention from me. But um, he's, uh, you know, he's getting more independent every day and I'm just, I feel like I'm almost out the other side. And then, yes, I'm going to jump in with all fours. Yeah. And uh, Lisa Henson and... Um, you know, Hallie and Alex Rockwell and all of them are being really, really supportive of uh, bringing more women into captaining and leadership Great. roles, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, you know, they've been bringing Donna into captain, and and uh, they're just they're just providing lots and lots of opportunities, which is which is really nice. And uh, you know, it's. It, you know, at first it was remarkable. It was like, oh, good for you. You're the first person on a Henson production. To, to, to. Now it, you know, that was only five years ago, and now it's like. That's not even remarkable anymore. Yeah. But it was remarkable five years yeah. ago. Uh, so yeah. go figure. <laughs> like it doesn't. You know, yeah. But it's not. Uh, it's no longer. A th- I mean, they 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 erased the remarkable the remarkableness of that in in a very short amount of time. That's good. That's great. So this was great. Yeah. It's about time. Okay, Alice. I've got some rapid fire questions for you. Uh, or are they about Peter Lintz? Because I want to talk about because I just like to say his name. That's fine. Incorporate right. him into your answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Yes. What's the hardest part about being a puppeteer? Oh, um, um, work-life balance and explaining to your parents' friends what you do. <laughs> What's the easiest? Uh, you don't have to really decide what to wear because it's just like soft, <laughs> grubby things. What's your... You know, like no business uh, casual. Right, right. There's nothing. No heels. That's good. What's your biggest strength as Use a something. puppeteer or a performer? Oh, oh, the, uh, well, we've been talking about it this whole time, like the variety, like a Swiss Army knife uh, elements of, yeah. you know, just being able to jump in and do a bunch of, bunch of different things and, and being very, very, being very detail oriented, I think. What is your biggest weakness then? Oh, I really hate auditioning. <laughs> just hate it. You know what? I, you just I have to, just, just don't care about it. When you don't care about it, yeah. you'll get the job. That's what I found. When I, when yeah. I care about it and I really want it, I never get it. When I go in and I'm just like, I'm just going to do this thing. That's when I tend to get the job because I've taken the pressure or something off myself. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> what was one of your favorite things? What's one of your favorite things about being a Muppet performer? Oh, all of you guys. I mean, the people are amazing. It's so fun. And the, and the, and the, these works of art that you get handed by, there are, are just, you just, these are things that I, saw in museums and had my mind blown and thought I would never even be able to touch. And they're just like, here you go. And you, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like, oh, thank you for this American icon. I'll put it on my hand now. I love, I love that. I still, geek out. I still get starstruck by like something I'm holding in yeah. my hand. If you weren't a puppeteer, what would be your career? Oh, okay. Uh, oh, gosh, I think I might have more kids. Um, but I also think I would be like a... Um, uh, I like I like architecture and interior design and 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 uh, you know I think I would have something to do with environments or gardens or uh, travel or something like that. That's nice. Uh, Jerry Nelson once said to me, "This is mm-hmm. the last question. Sesame Street is great, but you always have to have somebody that something that is your own that you create." So, Alice Deneen, what is that thing for mm. you? Uh, and but it, you cannot have used hot glue or anything to like f- fix something together. What would that thing be for you? Oh well, uh, well, kind of what I just did, kind of what I just mentioned. You've uh, um, you've been to my you've been to my house. I've been tinkering with a little Laurel Canyon mm-hmm. cabin for eighteen years, just just messing with it and doing this and that and building onto it and and uh, you know, switching things around and. And and fixing it, yeah. making it livable. I basically was a hardly habitable when I bought it, and uh, it's beautiful. And, uh, now it's I beautiful. Oh, thank you. I, so that's my it's my long term art project. Yeah, it's nice. See, not any. There's no suit. There's no hot glue in that house. There's no hot See? glue. It's beautiful. No. And that's Mm-mm. all you. I've seen your no, kitchen. I saw that about... kitchen. It was like amazing. You designed uh, well, that. That's all about gathering friends together and giving them. 
like a fair amount of alcohol and then sitting around telling <laughs> stories exactly like this. Like this is what I love to do. I love to tell stories about because we all have stories now and all I like that's what I love about your podcast, by the way. Can I? I want to interview you for this podcast. Oh. I want you to do this because okay. this is a because this is a um, you know you can cut this part out. You don't it doesn't need to be part of the. But um, you're making an archive of all of these wonderful stories of all of these people who have come to the same place somehow, yeah. but through different different ways. And your stories need you need this treatment. I'll I'll do it at and, some point. So now, before we go, there is actually hmm. one more special guest who has something to say. Alice Deneen and I met some 30 years ago in Atlanta, Georgia. I had just finished my first season on Sesame Street and she was two months out of college. It wasn't long after that when we started working together on Puzzle Place and Sesame Street and we just became just the best of friends. However, it wasn't until only a few years ago that we actually fell in love. It went something like this. Uh, we had been talking on the phone. My wife had died the year before, and uh, you know, I, didn't, I was feeling lonely, and she was going through some things. And, and she said, you know, maybe you and I could try dating. And I said, yeah, I was kind of thinking the same thing. And she said, yeah, and we could get a bottle of tequila. And if it's too weird, we can drink the tequila and swear <laughs> never to speak of this again. Well, as it turns out, we never had to open that bottle of tequila, and we ended up falling madly in love. You know, I was married to the woman of my dreams for nearly 24 years, and then she tragically died. And now I've ended up with just my best friend, and I just cannot believe my luck. As Alice so humbly tells me, you won the lottery twice, (laughs) and she's not wrong. (laughs) I love you, Allie Pally. Oh, don't call her Allie. She hates that. So Peter sent that along. That's real nice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm all teary. I, I'm, that's, thank you for, thank you for playing that yeah. for me. I wanted that's to save that until the end. Anything to say about Peter? Now is your chance. Before we go. Now is, I've been trying to wedge <laughs> this in. I know, but I wanted to wait show. until now. So now this will go nicely we, with that. Yeah. We yeah we were we were you know in the in the closet for quite a while as per as when it came to you know fans and or interviews or whatever because we just wanted to make sure it was going to work out we even tried to hide it from you guys but I don't no, think you work. bought that <laughs> no it didn't work it didn't, no no because all of us I don't know if you know this but <laughs> to my knowledge before you even got you guys even got together many of us were going. Alice and Peter should really get together. They really are so good <laughs> with each other. They should really get together. That was going on for a long time, like way before really? when my perception of when you guys uh, got together. Yeah. That's okay. Well, you know, you weren't wrong. No? <laughs> um, I I just, I, I uh, when he and I first got to be friends, you know, he kind of, when you first meet Peter, he's kind of too good to be true. Like my, I, I, I think I said the phrase, it's like he has sunshine <laughs> streaming out of his butt. Yeah. And I wasn't sure that that was like, is, are people really like that? It took me uh, in and, you know, people really are. He's, he's the loveliest human being. And I just... I adore him so much, and he's my best buddy, and he's been my best buddy for a really, really long time. I mean, we had Thanksgiving together, and there's a picture of you and me on the couch in Dobbs Ferry, with, and we, holding we're each holding a baby twin. Yes. We're holding the baby I, twins. I almost brought that Those up. Those twins. Yeah, that are now grown people. They're, they're 24 years old. Yeah, they're grown people. Yeah, <laughs> uh-huh. yeah they, they were so that's small. that's how long you and I... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you and me and those guys, we go, we go way, way back. back. And that's, 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 that's why it was needing to tread carefully because how weird for right. us, not only for ourselves, but also for everybody else if that had gone south. Right. But it has gone north. I don't know. That, yeah, don't whatever know. that. <laughs> I think that's yeah. got to be right. It's gone it's north. Be. I mean, what else would yeah. it be? Because it, it's either yeah. gone I mean, south or it's gone sideways. Those are two bad things. Those are two. Right? S- okay. So it's, yeah. So it must um, be north. So it's gone it's, and what is it in Peter Pan? Um, straight on till morning, yeah. third star on the right, yeah, sure. and straight on till, yeah. yes, it's whatever that is. <laughs> well, Alice, not Allie, 
Alice Deneen, thank you right. so much for talking to me today. I love you and I miss you. I love you and I miss you. And uh, I have a feeling that this post-pandemic phase is going to be full of joyous togetherness. Oh, yeah, it's going to be. I'll talk yeah. to you soon. All right. Take care. There you go. That's it. That is Below the Frame. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode where I'm going to be speaking with Noel McNeil. Get updates and stuff about Below the Frame, Muppets, Sesame Street, anything I feel like posting on my Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok accounts at Welcome Matt V, or just search my name. Below the Frame is produced by me, Matt Vogel, and if you like the show, I'm asking you, please rate and review it wherever you get your podcast. Thank you so much in advance. The theme song for Below the Frame was written by Stephanie DeBruzzo and performed by my band, The Mighty Weaklings. Our podcast logo was created by Dave Holtine at DaveHoltineDesign.com. The award from our sponsor, Player, for Cramped Spaces was Spencer Lott, who also wrote the bit. Thank you, Spencer. Thanks also to Alice Deneen, Peter Linz, and my son, Jack, for being a part of this show. And thanks to you, the fans, for listening. I'm Matt Vogel. We'll see you next time when we go Below the Frame. Bye-bye. Go, go.